Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. I am a historical fencing instructor and for a bit of fun on this channel of mine here I occasionally review fights from movies. Today we're looking at The Flame and the Arrow from 1950 starring Burt Lancaster. What we're about to look at now is pretty much the final fight of the film. Um, uh, there aren't actually many sword fights uh, with sword on sword but this is one of the few sword on sword fights in the movie. Burt Lancaster's character is not supposed to be an expert swordsman, he is an expert bowman and he's good at all round fighting but he's not primarily a swordsman. His opponent, played by Robert Douglas here, so Burt Lancaster is in red, Robert Douglas is in black just to help us out and uh, Robert Douglas, British actor of the time, is supposed to be a very good swordsman. Um, so uh, to set the scene what's happened is uh, Bert Lancaster's son has been um, taken or is just about to be taken hostage and he's rushing to try and get him to rescue him. Robert Douglas has betrayed Bert Lancaster and is essentially standing in his way. Um, what we're going to see is uh, essentially a fight that is of its time. It's from 1950 and um, movie fencing, theatrical sword fighting of this period fits into a particular type and it's based on sabre fencing, it's based on military sabre fencing of the sort of end of the Victorian period and indeed it's, it, it's influenced somewhat by sport fencing of the time. It is not, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, it is not really appropriate for the types of swords that they're using in the historical period that this is set in. This is set really around, uh, I think, the time of Frederick Barbarossa. So it's set, you know, in the Middle Ages. Anyway, let's have a look at the fight, or the beginning of it, and then we'll do a little bit more talking. Cheers. There's the boy. There's the man who betrayed you, darling. Why don't you kill him? He's a sword. Take mine. I'll kill you first. But you will defend me, Alessandro. As you say, I am your only hope of escape. I can't fight you with a sword. This you want to escape? I want my boy. I won't stop you. No, Dardo. I'm sorry I can't wait for the outcome. I wish you both the best of luck. You're my way of so let's just step in there, so an important um, note that Bert Lancaster made there, I can't fight you with a sword, he knows that his opponent, the Marchese, played by Robert Douglas, he knows that he's a better swordsman, um, but he needs to get to his son, he needs to rescue his son, so what, what do you do? You've got to fight, even if you know the opponent's better than you. So that's nice, it gives us a little bit of context to the fight, um, and actually, you know, this is a story, they're telling a story through a fight, so we're not just looking at this as a sword fight, but also the fact that supposedly um, Bert Lancaster is a far worse swordsman, or at least he assumes he is a far worse swordsman than his opponent. So what we have here, you'll notice they've got their swords presented out in front of them with their hands presented out. This is not generally speaking how you hold a medieval sword, it's how you might hold a sabre or a back sword, that is a sword which has a developed enclosed hilt that protects your hand, that makes it safe to have the sword held out extended in front of you. This is something that we really start to see more often um, in the Renaissance when developed hilts start to come in with uh, later period side swords what we call side swords and rapiers, and indeed with back swords and broadswords of the time, which have so-called basket hilts protecting the hand. Um, and really, what they're doing here, and the way that they're standing, the posture that they're standing in, is very much military saber stance, um, and it is essentially saber fencing. You'll notice also the cuts are pretty much all given from the wrist which again is a very saberish thing to do, it is partly indicative of a system where you start with the hand in front and a cut is made with a moulinet or a turn from the wrist. Of course if, you're, if you have a medieval hilt, the sword is usually held back in some position, these sort of positions back here, um, and it's as you might see in other martial arts, for example Kali and a screamer and things like this used with sticks, um, the hand is kept back and kept safe until you're either cutting or defending. Okay, so the hand is kept back and out of the way. The exception to that would be if we're using a shield or a buckler and then the shield or the buckler is held forwards 
and that can protect the sword hand, which means you can hold the sword forward. Here they've only got swords, they've only got what we would call arming swords, or one-handed medieval swords. Um, and they're very much using them in a sabre fashion. Let's watch a little bit more of the fight. Okay, so I've paused it there for a very specific reason, and it's to show you that all of the attacks, pretty much, you'll notice Bert Lancaster, although he is moving backwards, his opponent isn't what we do, what we call a lunge, that is, he's not extending the front foot forward. They're both pretty much shuffling forwards and backwards. This is somewhat unusual, and this is where it's not like real military sabre fencing. In real military sabre fencing, an attacker would attack on a lunge. That is, their front foot would extend forward, and their rear leg powering them would extend or stretch out, which means that they're covering distance as they attack, so that they come from a distance that's safe and out of distance to attacking and hitting at the same time as they move into that danger distance. Because this is theatrical swordsmanship, of the time, um, pretty much all of their blows are what we would call out of distance. That is, they're not lunging into hit, and they're just swinging their swords. This means that if the opponent didn't defend, the sword would just whistle straight past them. They wouldn't get hit by it. This is safe for theatrical purposes, and most of the viewers just don't know that. All they see is people scurrying up and down, and swords flashing and clanging and the sound. They don't realise that the so-called opponents, the actors, aren't in distance to hit each other. So if one of those actors failed their parry, they wouldn't get hit anyway. So it's primarily a safety thing. But also, there's no real reason to change that because most viewers don't realise what in distance and out of distance is. Um, so this really shows that the fight is being carried, carried out out of, out of distance. It's not in hitting range. Um, and the other thing that this results in is because a person's not having a weapon swung at their body and they're not having to guard it, um, essentially they're hitting swords in mid-air. So you imagine two people standing here and here and they're clanging swords. And this is very much how children sword fight. They hold their swords out and they go tap, 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 tap. And this is essentially what they're doing. Now they are doing it very well. They've choreographed a set of movements and they've had to memorise those mo movements just like the actors have had to memorise all their lines they've had to memorise where they have to be at any one point and what they're doing with their weapons so it's an admirable skill but it's very different to real fencing let's watch a bit more of the fight <laughs> Right, something else to comment on here is the guards or parries that they are using. They are very boom, boom, boom. They're very static. They're closing the line. Now, these do exist in medieval and Renaissance systems. So to say that they are wrong is not per se correct. We do find these kind of stop guards in medieval systems. We find them in Fiore. We find them in uh, Marozzo. We find them in loads of loads of you know Renaissance and medieval sources. However, the way that they're doing them and the exact positions that they're doing them in are very much, again, indicative of the fact that this is coming from sabre fencing, that it's coming from military and sporting sabre fencing of the time and sort of back into the late Victorian period. Um, uh, in, in, if it was medieval swordsmanship, we would be seeing more cutting into cuts, counter-cutting, rebatting as we call, that means beating aside an opponent's blade with either the back edge or the front edge. So more deflections, more voiding, more stepping around. And the other thing to mention as well, in conjunction with my last comments, is the footwork. So at the moment they're scurrying backwards and forwards, but you watch when I press play again, they're pretty much all the time keeping their right foot forward. This is highly unusual for medieval swordsmanship. Medieval swordsmanship usually works on the basis of passing footwork. That is, you put the left foot forward, then the right foot forward, then the left foot forward, then the right foot forward. Um, this isn't always the case. We do get advancing and lunging steps in medieval and renaissance swordsmanship, 
But the fact that they're keeping their right foot forward all the time, again, is something which comes from sabre fencing of the period. Let's watch a bit more. Again, we notice just in that little exchange that the attacker is advancing forward but not lunging with the attacks. It's very odd even in, in sabre fencing terms. This is what I would call bad fencing. So if my students are doing this just gathering forward, gathering forward, gathering forward, the problem is if they're in distance to hit and they're only, only gathering forward, they're in distance to be hit back as well. So we endeavour to make an attack on a lunge and then immediately recover back out of distance. And the general rule with military sabre fencing at least, at least in British sources, is that you only tend to make one attack for one lunge. So each time you make an attack, you make a lunge step. Here he's just gathering forward, but notice, as I mentioned, he's keeping the right foot forward all the time. Very unusual for medieval swordsmanship, far more normal for, let's say, 17th century and later swordsmanship. Um, let's watch a bit more. So that was an interesting one. The attacker extended his sword out and uh, Bert Lancaster pulled the chandelier over, or candlestick, whatever you want to call it, pulled the candlestick over and it, it knocked the sword out of his hand. I don't think that would happen. That was, that was a little, okay, it was fine as a, as a, you know, something to make the fight a bit more varied and a bit more interesting. But his, if a sword gets hit at the end here, all that happens is it just does that in your wrist. It doesn't knock it out of your hand. For it to get knocked out of your hand, it would have to get hit closer to the hand. That's my opinion anyway. Let's watch a bit more. I've got to say, I really like that, now we're in the dark, where a sword is just a long knife. Well, not really, it's still a sword, isn't it? And in actual fact, there are some fencing treatises which give some advice, if we look at Domenico Angelo from 1763, for example, they give some advice of what to do in the dark. And one of the things is you don't stand there with your sword motionless. Actually, you just start moving it around. If you can't see your opponents, or you're surrounded by multiple opponents, then you just cut all over the place, okay? And, uh, and try and get to either someone with light or create light or get out of the dark room. Um, but it's not a good place to be and certainly he's not standing in a very good place in the middle of the room. I would recommend if you do find yourself defending yourself in a sword fight in the dark, move your back to a corner or to a wall, okay? Don't stand there in the middle of the room. But nevertheless, I like it, um, Bert Lancaster says, you know, I'm not, essentially he's saying, I'm not a swordsman, but now the lights are out, I am a hunter and I know how to use a knife, and this is now a knife fight. I kind of, it doesn't make complete sense, in fact it doesn't make a lot of sense at all, but I like it anyway, it's a nice bit of, uh, nice bit of drama. You can't see me, can you, Alessandro? But I can see you. Careful, you're going to trip over the chandelier. So I've got to say, I really like the way they finished that. They finished it with sound and um, almost like a still life painting, just focusing on that one bit of the floor which has the shafts of light from the window, uh, from the moonlight across the floor. And you just hear the sounds and you hear the fight and you imagine the fight. And I think that's brilliant. In theatrical terms, that's all we needed. We know what a scuffle looks like. We know it's a messy scuffle in the dark with sharp implements. And Burt Lancaster, of course, because he's Burt Lancaster, won the fight. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting, um, and uh, that was The Flame and the Arrow. It's a good fun film, and it's got some awesome, awesome gymnastics in it. For those of you who don't know, um, Burt Lancaster did a lot of gymnastics, um, uh, trapeze and all sorts of stuff, 
um, tightrope walking, and he was a very talented man, also a very admirable man. If you look at the Wikipedia page on Bert Lancaster, he did some pretty cool things, um, and he seems like a really awesome dude. So there we go, I hope this has been interesting, and that's my view of the final sword fight in The Flame and the Arrow from 1950. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.